so our next panelist is Luis Fernando Chavez, who is a disease ecologist interested in the linkages between uneven development and disease emergence and prevention and the wonderful world of mosquitoes and other blood-sucking insects, like capitalists, I guess, but they're vampires, as Marx talks about them. Uh, Luis will speak on what is land, many things, but not what boot liquor storytellers tell us in fables blaming local indigenous and peasant populations. I can see why you all are in the same panel. And as uh, Luis is talking, I'll be putting in the chat links to various uh, articles and books uh, that Luis wants us to use as resources. Luis Fernando Chavez, bienvenido camarada. Please impart your wisdom and knowledge with us. Okay, oh, well, thank you, uh, Conrad Edgar and Conrad Rob for the invitation. And actually, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the last chapter of the book that is about what's land. And, and it's interesting because a lot of the discussion started to, well, are we really doing science or are we aiming to join the club near the Pond Circle, uh, referring to the Cosmos Club and to a story that was on the Vanity Fair, no, about how science at some levels work in the States and actually how like some fables are generated, no? like there is all these people that get money, they make a fable, they, they end up blaming people, uh, either indigenous or peasant populations. And from that point is that we started with the, a lot of the reflections no? that led to this dispatch which basically started with Rob asking me to write down a lot of ideas we were discussing over chat. Um, then came the, the dispatch. And what's interesting is like, when asking what's land, we started by trying to see the problem the way Dick Levins will look at it. And it's asking questions, not like what is the rest of the world when we talk about land? Can we see what's beyond uh, on, on the speeding and in the now, what alternatives are out there, what different futures are being generated. And in doing so, in while writing uh, this draft that ended up being the last chapter, we ended up studying people like Milton Santos that somehow say, well, there is a possibility for a different type of globalization. People like Wendy Wolf were saying, well, it's this age is the plantation of sin. A lot of the plantation of sin is related to how land is commodified and used, and, and it's becoming something different from what it used to be. People like Samira Min that talk about, okay, there is a lot of emerging development across the world, and a lot of the things are related to how the global capitalism works. And ultimately, people like indigenous uh, authors like Liana uh, Simpson, who actually argue, okay, land is also pedagogy, it's actually something from what we can learn. The other part of, of getting into this reflection was a, a lot of, well, there is all discussion about land and disease, but how much is actually land and disease and, and what are the real feedbacks, no? Is it this fable that, uh, or this type of fables that are built at places like the Cosmos Club in Washington, DC, or, or is, or is there a history uh, looking at things differently? And well, we ended up studying people like Angelo Celli, who actually was one of the first persons saying that, okay, a lot of the things that all the, the new diseases emerge is related to land, but actually thinking in terms of the problem of commoditizing land one, more than 100 years ago. And then there are like the classical disease ecologists, both, both from the global north, like Carl Johnson that was based in the States, or people like Escorza, who is like the big disease ecologist in Venezuela, for example, and was doing a lot of stuff that's ages ahead of what was being done here when thinking about things like neglected tropical diseases and the likes. People that are still, that retired recently, you know, like Bob Tesh, uh, that again, they are very scientific, so they won't get into the fables. They actually will go to the nature and, and give a coherent, a uh, thing that resonates with the experience that people have when these diseases emerge, not the fables uh, generated in the big clubs. And people like Carlota Monroy, you know, that, that's an active scientist in Guatemala that has done plenty of wonderful things that most of the disease ecologists in the States probably don't know, but actually I think she's making the revolution already, you know, trying to understand what's going on. 
And we also talk a bit about the personal experience of, of people like Nicole Gottenker and I that have been working for quite a while uh, at the Gorgatz Institute, which is an interesting institution because somehow it's a legacy of colonialism, but it's interesting in the sense that it's when colonialism or where in the imperial expansion, actually science was science and things were done correctly, at least from the synthetic standpoint. And in doing so, what well, we say there are like all the scientists, but also like the people that have been dealing with the diseases, no like We have learned a lot from the technicians and people that do the research with us that are ultimately the specialists. And, and again, on the interaction with the communities, no? a lot of the work, for example, with Guna native communities, and we learn a lot. And, and again, they, it's uh, what this made us rea or realize, or what we realized from this experience is the need for a different pedagogy. And in doing so, well, we ended up having a, a slightly different evolution of the manuscript, at least in the paper, and actually uh, that was published in a Capitalism, Nature, Socialism, and also making another critiques of very specific points, no? like the different faith, uh, myths that are common in, in disease ecology, no? like the things that all the problem is population growth, that there shouldn't be commons like the thing, the, the myth that the solution is to, to create the big hotels that Locke uh, criticizes so much, and that it's bad to do things in the field, that the problem is the way markers, and actually all these new mythologies and, and tables that are being really using like uh, big data modeling and saying that that's the truth, no? as, as is nicely depicted in this uh, drawing that by Nicole Gottenker, with whom we have been working on these issues. And then in that, a bit thinking on the pedagogy, you know, like I think that's a big issue that was mentioned, but I think uh, beyond the unionizing and all that, the, 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 the form needs to start earlier, you no? Know? How do we get the children to think differently, you no? Know? Like what are the, what are they, and again, what are, how, these things are done elsewhere, no? And, and in the book and in the papers, actually, we end up referring to the tale of the Mononoke Princess. That's a wonderful uh, animated movie, you no? Know, about how things can be done differently. And again, it's like a Japanese history. So even though it's called the Mononoke Princess, the Mononoke Princess is kind of one of the main protagonists, but not the main, main one. And what's interesting of that history is that we can always take the stand of Ashitaka. No? And Ashitaka is the, the other big protagonist of this tale, which basically at some point, there is a monster that's created by how humans relate to nature, that it's a good uh, metaphor of capitalism. And the only way to save the planet, to save the moment, the village is like giving this monster uh, its head back. And, and, and in doing so, like, at the end of the day, okay, the, the, the extinction is avoided in, in this tale. And, and Ashitaka actually realizes, okay, we are going to develop, we need to have a sort of a different develop. We still need to be in touch with whatever is the forest and whatever we do in the cities, whatever the ways in which we live uh, should be such that the environment that our the indigenous people no, uh, have the right to coexist with us and we shouldn't be appropriating and extracting everything from them as, as has been the role or the way it has been done up to this moment. Uh, again, I don't know, I'm, I'm very grateful that there are people like Rob because again, like people like Rob keep, everyone that wants to be a serious scientist and want to look at himself or her, and herself at the mirror in the morning and not feel bad. Uh, actually, when you read the things Rob does and a lot of his criticism makes a big difference and actually made you realize that you want to be a scientist and, and in my case, uh, or and I think it's the case of many people that there is no major interest in joining the Cosmos Club or creating fables and meet with actually doing science and actually doing science that improves uh, people people's uh, 
well-being and health, no? And I don't know, that's what I had to say actually, that this is what I, I thought, and I strongly recommend everyone to read this book, to buy the book, to read the book, and to read the previous books, no? Big Farms Makes Me Blue, because it's interesting that book, like from six, eight years ago, actually told this history that appeared in Vanity Fair last year about what was going on in the cosmos club without mentioning the cosmos club. 